Chapter sixty nine, part four of The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume six, by Edward Gibbon. Chapter sixty nine, Part four. After his decease, the tedious and equal suspense of the conclave was fixed by the dexterity of the French faction. A special offer was made and accepted that in the term of forty days they would elect one of the three candidates who should be named by their opponents. The Archbishop of Bordeaux, a furious enemy of his king and country, was the first on the list. But his ambition was known, and his conscience obeyed the calls of fortune and the commands of a benefactor, who had been informed by a swift messenger that the choice of a pope was now in his hands. The terms were regulated in a private interview, and with such speed and secrecy was the business transacted that the unanimous conclave applauded the election of Clement V. The cardinals of both parties were soon astonished by a summons to attend him beyond the Alps, from whence, as they soon discovered, they must never hope to return. He was engaged, by promise and affection, to prefer the residence of France, and after dragging his court through Poitou and Gascony, and devouring, by his expense, the cities and contents on the road, he finally reposed at Avignon, which flourished above seventy years, the seat of the Roman pontiff and the metropolis of Christendom. By land, by sea, by the Rhone, the position of Avignon was on all sides accessible. The southern provinces of France do not yield to Italy itself. New palaces arose from the accommodation of the Pope and cardinals, and the arts of luxury were soon attracted by the treasures of the church. They were already possessed of the adjacent territory, the Venaissin county, a populous and fertile spot, and the sovereignty of Avignon was afterwards purchased from the youth and distress of Jane, the first queen of Naples and countess of Provence, for the inadequate price of fourscore thousand florins. Under the shadow of a French monarchy, amidst an obedient people, the popes enjoyed an honorable and tranquil state, to which they long had been strangers. But Italy deplored their absence, and Rome, in solitude and poverty, might repent of the ungovernable freedom which had driven from the Vatican the successor of St. Peter. Her repentance was tardy and fruitless. After the death of the old members, the sacred college was filled with French cardinals, who beheld Rome and Italy with abhorrence and contempt, and perpetuated a series of national and even provincial popes, attached by the most indissoluble ties to their native country. The progress of industry had produced and enriched the Italian republics. The era of their liberty is the most flourishing period of population and agriculture, of manufactures and commerce, and their mechanic labors were gradually refined into the arts of elegance and genius. But the position of Rome was less favorable, the territory less fruitful, the character of the inhabitants was debased by indolence and elated by pride, and they fondly conceived that the tribute of subjects must forever nourish the metropolis of the church and empire. This prejudice was encouraged in some degree by the resort of pilgrims to the shrines of the apostles, and the last legacy of the popes, the institution of the holy year, was not less beneficial to the people than to the clergy. Since the loss of Palestine, the gift of plenary indulgences, which had been applied to the crusades, remained without an object, and the most valuable treasure of the church was sequestered above eight years from public circulation. A new channel was opened by the diligence of Boniface the Eighth, who reconciled the vices of ambition in avarice, and the Pope had sufficient learning to recollect and revive the secular games which were celebrated in Rome at the conclusion of every century. To sound without danger the depths of popular credulity, a sermon was seasonably pronounced, a report was artfully scattered, some aged witnesses were produced, and on the 1st of January of the year 1300, the church of St. Peter was crowded with the faithful, who demanded the customary indulgence of the holy time. The pontiff, who watched and irritated their devout impatience, 
was soon persuaded by ancient testimony of the justice of their claim, and he proclaimed a plenary absolution to all Catholics, who, in the course of that year and at every similar period, should respectfully visit the apostolic churches of St. Peter and St. Paul. The welcome sound was propagated through Christendom, and at first from the nearest provinces of Italy, and at length from the remote kingdoms of Hungary and Britain, the highways were thronged with a swarm of pilgrims who sought to expiate their sins in a journey, however costly or laborious, which was exempt from the perils of military service. All exceptions of rank or sex, of age or infirmity, were forgotten in the common transport, and in the streets and churches many persons were trampled to death by the eagerness of devotion. The calculation of their numbers could not be easy nor accurate, and they have probably been magnified by the asterisk clergy, well apprised of the contagion of example. Yet we are assured by a judicious historian, who assisted at the ceremony, that Rome was never replenished with less than two hundred thousand strangers, and another spectator has fixed at two millions the total concourse of the year. A trifling oblation from each individual would accumulate a royal treasure, and two priests stood night and day, with rakes in their hands, to collect without counting the heaps of gold and silver that were poured on the altar of St. Paul. It was fortunately a season of peace and plenty, and if forage was scarce, if inns and lodgings were extravagantly dear, an exhaustible a supply of bread and wine, of meat and fish, was provided by the policy of Boniface and the venal hospitality of the Romans. From a city without trade or industry, all casual riches will speedily evaporate, but the avarice and envy of the next generation solicited Clement the VI to anticipate the distant period of the century. The gracious pontiff complied with their wishes, afforded Rome this poor consolation for his loss, and justified the change by the name and practice of the Mosaic Jubilee. His summons was obeyed, and the number, zeal, and liberality of the pilgrims did not yield to the primitive festival but they encountered the triple scourge of war, pestilence, and famine. Many wives and virgins were violated in the castles of Italy, and many strangers were pillaged or murdered by the savage Romans, no longer moderated by the presence of their bishops. To the impatience of the popes we may ascribe the successive reduction to fifty, thirty-three, and twenty-five years, although the second of these terms is commensurate with the life of Christ. The profusion of indulgences, the revolt of the Protestants, and the decline of superstition have much diminished the value of the Jubilee. Yet even the nineteenth and last festival was a year of pleasure and profit to the Romans, and the philosophic smile will not disturb the triumph of the priest or the happiness of the people. In the beginning of the eleventh century, Italy was exposed to the feudal tyranny, alike oppressive to the sovereign and to the people. The rights of human nature were vindicated by her numerous republics, who soon extended their liberty and dominion from the city to the adjacent country. The sword of the nobles was broken, their slaves were enfranchised, their castles were demolished, they assumed the habits of society and obedience, their ambition was confined to municipal honors, and in the proudest aristocracy of Venice or Genoa, each patrician was subject to the laws." but the feeble and disorderly government of Rome was unequal to the task of curbing her rebellious sons, who scorned the authority of the magistrate within and without the walls. It was no longer a civil contention between the nobles and plebeians from the government of the state. The barons asserted in arms their personal independence, their palaces and castles were fortified against the siege, and their private quarrels were maintained by the numbers of their vassals and retainers. In origin and affection, they were aliens to the country, and a genuine Roman, could such have been produced, might have renounced these haughty strangers, who disdained the appellation of citizens, and proudly styled themselves the princes of Rome. After a dark series of revolutions, all records of pedigree were lost, the distinction of surnames were abolished, the blood of the nations was mingled with a thousand channels, and the Goths and Lombards, the Greeks and Franks, the Germans and Normans, had obtained the fairest possessions by royal bounty, or the prerogative of valor. These examples might be readily presumed, but the elevation of a Hebrew race to the rank of senators and consuls 
is an event without a parallel in the long captivity of these miserable exiles. In the time of Leo the Ninth, a wealthy and learned Jew was converted to Christianity and honored at his baptism with the name of his godfather, the reigning Pope. The zeal and courage of Peter, the son of Leo, were signalized in the cause of Gregory the Seventh, who entrusted his faithful adherent with the government of Adrian's Mole, the Tower of Crescentius, or, as it is now called, the Castle of St. Angelo. Both the father and the son were the parents of a numerous progeny. Their riches, the fruits of usury, were shared with the noblest families of the city, and so extensive was their alliance that the grandson of the proselyte was exalted by the weight of his kindred to the throne of St. Peter. A majority of the clergy and people supported his cause. He reigned several years in the Vatican, and it is only the eloquence of St. Benrad and the final triumph of Innocent II that has branded Anacletus with the epithet of Antipope. After his defeat and death, the posterity of Leo is no longer conspicuous, and none will be found of the modern nobles ambitious of descending from a Jewish stock. It is not my design to enumerate the Roman families which have failed at different periods, or those which are continued in different degrees of splendor to the present time. The old consular line of the Frangipani discovers their name in the generous act of breaking or dividing bread in a time of famine, and such benevolence is more truly glorious than to have enclosed with their allies the Corsi, a spacious quarter of the city, in the chains of their fortifications. The Savelli, as it should seem a Sabine race, have maintained their original dignity. The obsolete surname of the Capizucci is inscribed on the coins of the first senators. The Conti preserve the honor without the estate of the Counts of Signia, and the Annibaldi must have been very ignorant or very modest if they had not descended from the Carthaginian hero. But among, perhaps above, the peers and princes of the city, I distinguish the rival houses of Colonna and Ursini, whose private story is an essential part of the annals of modern Rome. The name and arms of Colonna have been the theme of much doubtful etymology, nor have the orators and antiquarians overlooked either Trajan's pillar, or the columns of Hercules, or the pillar of Christ's flagellation, or the luminous column that guided the Israelites in the desert. Their first historical appearance in the year 1104 attests the power and antiquity, while it explains the simple meaning of the name. By the usurpation of Cavae, the Colonna provoked the arms of Pascal II, but they lawfully held in the Campania of Rome the hereditary fiefs of Zagarola and Colonna, and the latter of these towns was probably adorned with some lofty pillar, the relic of a villa or temple. They likewise possessed one moiety of the neighboring city of Tusculum, a strong presumption of their descent from the counts of Tusculum, who in the tenth century were the tyrants of the Apostolic See. According to their own and the public opinion, the primitive and remote source was derived from the banks of the Rhine, and the sovereigns of Germany were not ashamed of a real or fabulous affinity with a noble race, which in the revolutions of seven hundred years has been often illustrated by merit and always by fortune. About the end of the thirteenth century, the most powerful branch was composed of an uncle and six brothers, all conspicuous in arms, or in the honors of the church. Of these, Peter was elected senator of Rome, introduced to the capital in a triumphal car, and hailed in some vain acclamations with the title of Caesar. While John and Stephen were declared Marquis of Ancona, and Count of Romagna, by Nicholas IV, a patron so partial to their family, that he has been delineated in satirical portraits, imprisoned, as it were, in a hollow pillar. After his decease, their haughty behavior provoked the displeasure of the most implacable of mankind. The two cardinals, the uncle and the nephew, denied the election of Boniface VIII, and the Colonna were oppressed by, for a moment by his temporal and spiritual arms. He proclaimed a crusade against his personal enemies. Their estates were confiscated. Their fortresses on either side of the Tiber were besieged by the troops of St. Peter and those of the rival nobles. And after the ruin of Palestrina or Praeneste, their principal seat, the ground was marked with a plugshare. 
the emblem of perpetual desolation. Degraded, banished, proscribed, the six brothers, in disguise and danger, wandered over Europe without renouncing the hope of deliverance and revenge. In this double hope the French court was their surest asylum. They prompted and directed the enterprise of Philip, and I should praise their magnanimity, had they respected the misfortune and courage of the captive tyrant. His civil acts were annulled by the Roman people, who restored the honors and possessions of the Colonna, and some estimate may be formed of their wealth by their losses, of their losses by the damages of one hundred thousand gold florins, which were granted them against the accomplices and heirs of the deceased Pope. All the spiritual censures and disqualifications were abolished by his prudent successors, and the fortune of the house was more firmly established by this transient hurricane. The boldness of Schiara Colonna was signalized in the captivity of Boniface, and long afterwards in the coronation of Louis of Bavaria, and by the gratitude of the emperor, the pillar in their arms was encircled with a royal crown. But the first of the family in fame and merit was the elder Stephen, whom Petrarch loved and esteemed as a hero superior to his own times, and not unworthy of ancient Rome. Persecution and exile displayed to the nations his abilities in peace and war. In his distress he was an object, not of pity, but of reverence. The aspect of danger provoked him to avow his name and country, and when he was asked, Where is now your fortress? He laid his hand on his heart, and answered, Here. He supported with the same virtue the return of prosperity, and, till the ruin of his declining age, the ancestors, the character, and the children of Stephen Colonna exalted his dignity in the Roman Republic, and at the court of Avignon. The Ursini migrated from Spoleto, the sons of Ursus, as they are styled in the twelfth century, from some eminent person, who is only known as the father of their race. But they were soon distinguished among the nobles of Rome, by the number and bravery of their kinsmen, the strength of their towers, the honors of the senate and sacred college, and the elevation of two popes, Celestine the Third and Nicholas the Third, of their name and lineage. Their riches may be accused as an early abuse of nepotism. The estates of St. Peter were alienated in the favor by the liberal Celestine, and Nicholas was ambitious for their sake to solicit the alliance of monarchs, to found new kingdoms in Lombardy and Tuscany, and to invest them with the perpetual office of senators of Rome. All that has been observed of the greatness of the Colonna will likewise redeem to the glory of the Ursini, their constant and equal antagonists in the long hereditary void, which distracted above two hundred and fifty years the ecclesiastical state. The jealousy of preeminence and power was the true ground of their quarrel, but as a specious badge of distinction, the Colonna embraced the name of Ghibellines and the party of the empire, the Ursini espoused the title of Guelphs and the cause of the church. The eagle and the keys are displayed in their adverse banners, and the two factions of Italy most furiously raged, when the origin and nature of the dispute were long since forgotten. After the retreat of the popes to Avignon, they disputed in arms the vacant republic, and the mischiefs of discord were perpetuated by the wretched compromise of electing each year two rival senators. By their private hostilities the city and country were desolated, and the fluctuating balance inclined with their alternate success. But none of either family had fallen by the sword, till the most renowned champion of the Ursini was surprised and slain by the younger Stephen Colonna. His triumph was stained with the reproach of violating the truce. Their defeat was basely avenged by the assassination, before the church door, of an innocent boy and his two servants. Yet the victorious Colonna, with an annual colleague, was declared senator of Rome during the term of five years. And the muse of Petrarch inspired a wish, a hope, a prediction, that the generous youth, the son of his venerable hero, would restore Rome and Italy to their pristine glory, that his justice would extirpate the wolves and lions, the serpents and bears, who labored to subvert the eternal basis of the marble column. End of chapter 69 
State of Rome from the 12th century. Seventy, Part One of the History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Six, Chapter Seventy: Final Settlement of the Ecclesiastical State, Part One. Character and Coronation of Petrarch. Restoration of the freedom and government of Rome by the Tribune Rienzi, his virtues and vices, his expulsion and death, return of the popes from Avignon, great schism of the West, reunion of the Latin Church, last struggles of Roman liberty, statutes of Rome, final settlement of the ecclesiastical state. In the apprehension of modern times, Petrarch is the Italian songster of Laura and love. In the harmony of his Tuscan rhymes, Italy applauds, or rather adores, the father of her lyric poetry, and his verse, or at least his name, is repeated by the enthusiasm or affectation of amorous sensibility. Whatever may be the private taste of a stranger, his slight and superficial knowledge should humbly acquiesce in the judgment of a learned nation, yet I may hope or presume that the Italians do not compare the tedious uniformity of sonnets and elegies with the sublime compositions of their epic muse, the original wildness of Dante, the regular beauties of Tasso, and the boundless variety of the incomparable Ariosto. The merits of the lover I am still less qualified to appreciate, nor am I deeply interested in a metaphysical passion for a nymph so shadowy that her existence has been questioned, for a matron so prolific that she was delivered of eleven legitimate children, while her amorous swain sighed and sung at the fountain of Vaucluse. But, in the eyes of Petrarch, and those of his graver contemporaries, his love was a sin, and Italian verse a frivolous amusement. His Latin works, of philosophy, poetry, and eloquence, established his serious reputation, which was soon diffused from Avignon over France and Italy, his friends and disciples were multiplied in every city, and if the ponderous volume of his writings be now abandoned to a long repose, our gratitude must applaud the man who, by precept and example, revived the spirit and study of the Augustan age. From his earliest youth, Petrarch aspired to the poetic crown. The academical honours of the three faculties had introduced a royal degree of master or doctor in the art of poetry, and the title of Poet Laureate, which custom rather than vanity perpetuates in the English court, was first invented by the Caesars of Germany. In the musical games of antiquity, a prize was bestowed on the victor. The belief that Virgil and Horace had been crowned in the capital inflamed the emulation of a Latin bard, and the laurel was endeared to the lover by a verbal resemblance with the name of his mistress. The value of either object was enhanced by the difficulties of the pursuit, and if the virtue or prudence of Laura was inexorable, he enjoyed, and might boast of enjoying, the nymph of poetry. His vanity was not of the most delicate kind, since he applauds the success of his own labours, his name was popular, his friends were active, the open or secret opposition of envy and prejudice was surmounted by the dexterity of patient merit. In the thirty-sixth year of his age he was solicited to accept the object of his wishes, and on the same day, in the solitude of Vaucluse, he received a similar and solemn invitation from the Senate of Rome and the University of Paris. The learning of a theological school and the ignorance of a lawless city were alike unqualified to bestow the ideal though immortal wreath which genius may obtain from the free applause of the public and of posterity, but the candidate dismissed this troublesome reflection, and after some moments of complacency and suspense, preferred the summons of the metropolis of the world. The ceremony of his coronation was performed in the capital, by his friend and patron the supreme magistrate of the Republic. Twelve patrician youths were arrayed in scarlet, 
six representatives of the most illustrious families in green robes with garlands of flowers accompanied the procession in the midst of the princes and nobles the senator count of anguilara a kinsman of the colonna assumed his throne and at the voice of a herald petrarch arose after discoursing on a text of virgil and thrice repeating his vows for the prosperity of rome he knelt before the throne and received from the senator a laurel crown with a more precious declaration this is the reward of merit the people shouted long life to the capital and the poet a sonnet in praise of rome was accepted as the effusion of genius and gratitude and after the whole procession had visited the vatican the profane wreath was suspended before the shrine of st peter in the act or diploma which was presented to petrarch the title and prerogatives of poet laureate are revived in the capital after the lapse of thirteen hundred years and he receives the perpetual privilege of wearing at his choice a crown of laurel ivy or myrtle of assuming the poetic habit and of teaching disputing interpreting and composing in all places whatsoever and on all subjects of literature the grant was ratified by the authority of the senate and people and the character of citizen was the recompense of his affection for the roman name they did him honour but they did him justice in the familiar society of cicero and livy he had imbibed the ideas of an ancient patriot and his ardent fancy kindled every idea to a sentiment and every sentiment to a passion the aspect of the seven hills and their majestic ruins confirmed these lively impressions and he loved a country by whose liberal spirit he had been crowned and adopted the poverty and debasement of rome excited the indignation and pity of her grateful son he dissembled the faults of his fellow-citizens applauded with partial fondness the last of their heroes and matrons and in the remembrance of the past in the hopes of the future was pleased to forget the miseries of the present time rome was still the lawful mistress of the world the pope and the emperor the bishop and general had abdicated their station by an inglorious retreat to the rhone and the danube but if she could resume her virtue the republic might again vindicate her liberty and dominion amidst the indulgence of enthusiasm and eloquence petrarch italy and europe were astonished by a revolution which realized for a moment his most splendid visions the rise and fall of the tribune rienzi will occupy the following pages the subject is interesting the materials are rich and the glance of a patriot bard will sometimes vivify the copious but simple narrative of the florentine and more especially of the roman historian in a quarter of the city which was inhabited only by mechanics and jews the marriage of an innkeeper and a washerwoman produced the future deliverer of rome from such parents nicolas rienzi gabrini could inherit neither dignity nor fortune and the gift of a liberal education which they painfully bestowed was the cause of his glory and untimely end the study of history and eloquence the writings of cicero seneca livy caesar and valerius maximus elevated above his equals and contemporaries the genius of the young plebeian he perused with indefatigable diligence the manuscripts and marbles of antiquity loved to dispense his knowledge in familiar language and was often provoked to exclaim where are now these romans their virtue their justice their power why was i not born in these happy times when the republic addressed to the throne of avignon an embassy of the three orders the spirit and eloquence of rienzi recommended him to a place among the thirteen deputies of the commons the orator had the honour of haranguing pope clement the sixth and the satisfaction of conversing with petrarch a congenial mind but his aspiring hopes were chilled by disgrace and poverty and the patriot was reduced to a single garment and the charity of the hospital from this misery he was relieved by the sense of merit or the smile of favour and the employment of apostolic notary afforded him a daily stipend of five gold florins a more honourable and extensive connection and the right of contrasting both in words and actions his own integrity 
with the vices of the state. The eloquence of Rienzi was prompt and persuasive. The multitude is always prone to envy and censure. He was stimulated by the loss of a brother and the impunity of the assassins, nor was it possible to excuse or exaggerate the public calamities. The blessings of peace and justice, for which civil society has been instituted, were banished from Rome. The jealous citizens, who might have endured every personal or pecuniary injury, were most deeply wounded in the dishonour of their wives and daughters. They were equally oppressed by the arrogance of the nobles and the corruption of the magistrates, and the abuse of arms or of laws was the only circumstance that distinguished the lions from the dogs and serpents of the capital. These allegorical emblems were variously repeated in the pictures which Rienzi exhibited in the streets and churches, and while the spectators gazed with curious wonder, the bold and ready orator unfolded the meaning, applied the satire, inflamed their passions, and announced a distant hope of comfort and deliverance. The privileges of Rome, her eternal sovereignty over her princes and provinces, was the theme of his public and private discourse, and a monument of servitude became in his hands a title and incentive of liberty. The decree of the Senate, which granted the most ample prerogatives to the Emperor Vespasian, had been inscribed on a copper plate still extant in the choir of the Church of St. John Lateran. A numerous assembly of nobles and plebeians was invited to this political lecture, and a convenient theatre was erected for their reception. The notary appeared in a magnificent and mysterious habit, explained the inscription by aversion and commentary, and descanted with eloquence and zeal on the ancient glories of the Senate and people, from whom all legal authority was derived. The supine ignorance of the nobles was incapable of discerning the serious tendency of such representations. They might sometimes chastise with words and blows the plebeian reformer, but he was often suffered in the Colonna Palace to amuse the company with his threats and predictions, and the modern Brutus was concealed under the mask of folly and the character of a buffoon. While they indulged their contempt, the restoration of the good estate, his favourite expression, was entertained among the people as a desirable, a possible, and at length as an approaching event, and while all had the disposition to applaud, some had the courage to assist their promised deliverer. A prophecy, or rather a summons, affixed on the church door of St. George, was the first public evidence of his designs. A nocturnal assembly of a hundred citizens on Mount Aventine, the first step to their execution. After an oath of secrecy and aid, he represented to the conspirators the importance and facility of their enterprise, that the nobles, without union or resources, were strong only in the fear of their imaginary strength, that all power as well as right was in the hands of the people, that the revenues of the apostolical chamber might relieve the public distress, and that the Pope himself would approve their victory over the common enemies of government and freedom. After securing a faithful band to protect his first declaration, he proclaimed through the city, by sound of trumpet, that on the evening of the following day all persons should assemble without arms before the church of St. Angelo, to provide for the re-establishment of the good estate. The whole night was employed in the celebration of thirty masses of the Holy Ghost, and in the morning Rienzi, bareheaded but in complete armour, issued from the church, encompassed by the hundred conspirators. The Pope's vicar, the simple Bishop of Orvieto, who had been persuaded to sustain a part in this singular ceremony, marched on his right hand, and three great standards were borne aloft as the emblems of their design. In the first, the banner of liberty, Rome was seated on two lions, with a palm in one hand and a globe in the other. St. Paul, with a drawn sword, was delineated in the banner of justice, and in the third, St. Peter held the keys of concord and peace. Rienzi was encouraged by the presence and applause of an innumerable crowd, who understood little and hoped much, and the procession slowly rolled forwards from the castle of St. Angelo to the capital. 
his triumph was disturbed by some secret emotions which he laboured to suppress, he ascended without opposition, and with seeming confidence, the citadel of the Republic, harangued the people from the balcony, and received the most flattering confirmation of his acts and laws. The nobles, as if destitute of arms and councils, beheld in silent consternation this strange revolution, and the moment had been prudently chosen when the most formidable, Stephen Colonna, was absent from the city. On the first rumour he returned to his palace, affected to despise this plebeian tumult, and declared to the messenger of Rienzi that at his leisure he would cast the madman from the windows of the capital. The great bell instantly rang an alarm, and so rapid was the tide, so urgent was the danger, that Colonna escaped with precipitation to the suburb of St. Lawrence. From thence, after a moment's refreshment, he continued the same speedy career, till he reached in safety his castle of Palestrina, lamenting his own imprudence, which had not trampled the spark of this mighty conflagration. A general and peremptory order was issued from the capital to all the nobles that they should peaceably retire to their estates. They obeyed, and their departure secured the tranquillity of the free and obedient citizens of Rome. But such voluntary obedience evaporates with the first transports of zeal, and Rienzi felt the importance of justifying his usurpation by a regular form and a legal title. At his own choice the Roman people would have displayed their attachment and authority by lavishing on his head the names of senator or consul, of king or emperor. He preferred the ancient and modest appellation of tribune. The protection of the commons was the essence of that sacred office, and they were ignorant that it had never been invested with any share in the legislative or executive powers of the Republic. In this character, and with the consent of the Roman, the tribune enacted the most salutary laws for the restoration and maintenance of the good estate. By the first he fulfils the wish of honesty and inexperience that no civil suit should be protracted beyond the term of fifteen days. The danger of frequent perjury might justify the pronouncing against a false accuser the same penalty which his evidence would have inflicted. The disorders of the times might compel the legislator to punish every homicide with death, and every injury with equal retaliation. But the execution of justice was hopeless till he had previously abolished the tyranny of the nobles. It was formally provided that none, except the supreme magistrate, should possess or command the gates, bridges, or towers of the state, that no private garrison should be introduced into the towns or castles of the Roman territory, that none should bear arms or presume to fortify their houses in the city or country, that the barons should be responsible for the safety of the highways and the free passage of provisions, and that the protection of malefactors and robbers should be expiated by a fine of a thousand marks of silver. But these regulations would have been impotent and nugatory had not the licentious nobles been awed by the sword of the civil power. A sudden alarm from the bell of the capital could still summon to the standard above twenty thousand volunteers. The support of the tribune and the laws required a more regular and permanent force. In each harbour of the coast a vessel was stationed for the assurance of commerce. A standing militia of three hundred and sixty horse and thirteen hundred foot was levied, clothed and paid in the thirteen quarters of the city, and the spirit of a commonwealth may be traced in the grateful allowance of one hundred florins or pounds to the heirs of every soldier who lost his life in the service of his country. For the maintenance of the public defence, for the establishment of granaries, for the relief of widows, orphans, and indigent convents, Rienzi applied, without fear of sacrilege, the revenues of the apostolic chamber. The three branches of hearth-money, the salt-duty and the customs, were each of the annual produce of one hundred thousand florins, and scandalous were the abuses, if in four or five months the amount of the salt-duty could be trebled by his judicious economy. After thus restoring the forces and finances of the Republic, the Tribune recalled the nobles from their solitary independence, required their personal appearance in the capital, and imposed an oath of allegiance to the new government, and of submission to the laws of the good estate. 
Apprehensive of their safety, but still more apprehensive of the danger of a refusal, the princes and barons returned to their houses at Rome in the garb of simple and peaceful citizens. The Colonna and Orsini, the Savelli and Frangipani, were confounded before the tribunal of a plebeian, of the vile buffoon whom they had so often derided, and their disgrace was aggravated by the indignation which they vainly struggled to disguise. The same oath was successively pronounced by the several orders of society, the clergy and gentlemen, the judges and notaries, the merchants and artisans, and the gradual descent was marked by the increase of sincerity and zeal. They swore to live and die with the Republic and the Church, whose interest was artfully united by the nominal association of the Bishop of Orvieto, the Pope's vicar, to the office of tribune. It was the boast of Rienzi that he had delivered the throne and patrimony of St. Peter from a rebellious aristocracy, and Clement the Sixth, who rejoiced in its fall, affected to believe the professions, to applaud the merits, and to confirm the title of his trusty servant. The speech, perhaps the mind, of the tribune was inspired with a lively regard for the purity of the faith. He insinuated his claim to a supernatural mission from the Holy Ghost, enforced by a heavy forfeiture the annual duty of confession and communion, and strictly guarded the spiritual as well as the temporal welfare of his faithful people. End of chapter 70, part 1《Part II of the History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons. — The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 6. — Chapter 70. Final Settlement of the Ecclesiastical State, Part II. Never, perhaps, has the energy and effect of a single mind been more remarkably felt than in the sudden, though transient, reformation of Rome by the Tribune Rienzi. A den of robbers was converted to the discipline of a camp or convent, patient to hear, swift to redress, inexorable to punish, his tribunal was always accessible to the poor and stranger, nor could birth or dignity or the immunities of the church protect the offender or his accomplices. The privileged houses, the private sanctuaries in Rome, on which no officer of justice would presume to trespass, were abolished, and he applied the timber and iron of their barricades in the fortifications of the capital. The venerable father of the Colonna was exposed in his own palace to the double shame of being desirous and of being unable to protect a criminal. A mule with a jar of oil had been stolen near Capranica and the lord of the Ursini family was condemned to restore the damage and to discharge a fine of four hundred florins for his negligence in guarding the highways. Nor were the persons of the barons more inviolate than their lands or houses, and either from accident or design the same impartial rigour was exercised against the heads of the adverse factions. Peter Agapet Colonna, who had himself been senator of Rome, was arrested in the street for injury or debt, and justice was appeased by the tardy execution of Martin Ursini, who, among his various acts of violence and rapine, had pillaged a shipwrecked vessel at the mouth of the Tiber. His name, the purple of two cardinals, his uncles, a recent marriage and a mortal disease, were disregarded by the inflexible tribune who had chosen his victim. The public officers dragged him from his palace and nuptial bed, his trial was short and satisfactory. The bell of the capital convened the people. Stripped of his mantle, on his knees, with his hands bound behind his back, he heard the sentence of death, and after a brief confession, Orsini was led away to the gallows. After such an example, none who were conscious of guilt could hope for impunity, and the flight of the wicked, the licentious, and the idle soon purified the city and territory of Rome. In this time, says the historian, the woods began to rejoice that they were no longer infested with robbers, the oxen began to plough, the pilgrims visited the sanctuaries, the roads and inns were replenished with travellers, 
trade, plenty, and good faith were restored in the markets, and a purse of gold might be exposed without danger in the midst of the highway. As soon as the life and property of the subject are secure, the labours and rewards of industry spontaneously revive. Rome was still the metropolis of the Christian world, and the fame and fortunes of the tribune were diffused in every country by the strangers who had enjoyed the blessings of his government. The deliverance of his country inspired Rienzi with a vast and perhaps visionary idea of uniting Italy in a great federative republic, of which Rome should be the ancient and lawful head, and the free cities and princes the members and associates. His pen was not less eloquent than his tongue, and his numerous epistles were delivered to swift and trusty messengers. On foot, with a white wand in their hand, they traversed the forests and mountains, enjoyed in the most hostile states the sacred security of ambassadors, and reported, in the style of flattery or truth, that the highways along their passage were lined with kneeling multitudes who implored heaven for the success of their undertaking. Could passion have listened to reason, could private interest have yielded to the public welfare, the supreme tribunal and confederate union of the Italian Republic might have healed their intestine discord, and closed the Alps against the barbarians of the north. But the propitious season had elapsed, and if Venice, Florence, Siena, Perugia, and many inferior cities offered their lives and fortunes to the good estate, the tyrants of Lombardy and Tuscany must despise or hate the plebeian author of a free constitution. From them, however, and from every part of Italy, the tribune received the most friendly and respectful answers. They were followed by the ambassadors of the princes and republics, and in this foreign conflux, on all the occasions of pleasure or business, the low-born notary could assume the familiar or majestic courtesy of a sovereign. The most glorious circumstance of his reign was an appeal to his justice from Louis, king of Hungary, who complained that his brother and her husband had been perfidiously strangled by Jane, queen of Naples. Her guilt or innocence was pleaded in a solemn trial at Rome, but after hearing the advocates, the tribune adjourned this weighty and invidious cause, which was soon determined by the sword of the Hungarian. Beyond the Alps, more especially at Avignon, the revolution was the theme of curiosity, wonder, and applause. Petrarch had been the private friend, perhaps the secret counsellor, of Rienzi. His writings breathed the most ardent spirit of patriotism and joy, and all respect for the Pope, all gratitude for the Colonna, was lost in the superior duties of a Roman citizen. The poet laureate of the capital maintains the act, applauds the hero, and mingles with some apprehension and advice the most lofty hopes of the permanent and rising greatness of the Republic. While Petrarch indulged these prophetic visions, the Roman hero was fast declining from the meridian of fame and power, and the people who had gazed with astonishment on the ascending meteor began to mark the irregularity of its course and the vicissitudes of light and obscurity. More eloquent than judicious, more enterprising than resolute, the faculties of Rienzi were not balanced by cool and commanding reason. He magnified in a tenfold proportion the objects of hope and fear, and prudence, which could not have erected, did not presume to fortify his throne. In the blaze of prosperity, his virtues were insensibly tinctured with the adjacent vices. Justice with cruelty, liberality with profusion, and the desire of fame with puerile and ostentatious vanity. He might have learned that the ancient tribunes, so strong and sacred in the public opinion, were not distinguished in style, habit, or appearance from an ordinary plebeian, and that as often as they visited the city on foot, a single viator or beadle attended the exercise of their office. The Gracchi would have frowned or smiled could they have read the sonorous titles and epithets of their successor. Nicholas, severe and merciful, deliverer of Rome, defender of Italy, friend of mankind, and of liberty, peace, and justice, tribune august. His theatrical pageants had prepared the revolution, but Rienzi abused, in luxury and pride, the political maxim of speaking to the eyes, as well as the understanding, of the multitude. 
From nature he had received the gift of a handsome person, till it was swelled and disfigured by intemperance, and his propensity to laughter was corrected in the magistrate by the affectation of gravity and sternness. He was clothed, at least on public occasions, in a party-coloured robe of velvet or satin, lined with fur and embroidered with gold. The rod of justice which he carried in his hand was a sceptre of polished steel, crowned with a globe and a cross of gold, and enclosing a small fragment of the true and holy wood. In his civil and religious processions through the city he rode on a white steed, the symbol of royalty. The great banner of the Republic, a sun with a circle of stars, a dove with an olive branch, was displayed over his head. A shower of gold and silver was scattered among the populace. Fifty guards with halberds encompassed his person. A troop of horse preceded his march, and their timbrels and trumpets were of massy silver. The ambition of the honours of chivalry betrayed the meanness of his birth, and degraded the importance of his office, and the equestrian tribune was not less odious to the nobles, whom he adopted, than to the plebeians, whom he deserted. All that yet remained of treasure, or luxury, or art, was exhausted on that solemn day. Rienzi led the procession from the capital to the Lateran, the tediousness of the way was relieved with decorations and games, the ecclesiastical, civil, and military orders marched under their various banners, the Roman ladies attended his wife, and the ambassadors of Italy might loudly applaud or secretly deride the novelty of the pomp. In the evening, when they had reached the church and palace of Constantine, he thanked and dismissed the numerous assembly, with an invitation to the festival of the ensuing day. From the hands of a venerable knight he received the order of the Holy Ghost. The purification of the bath was a previous ceremony, but in no step of his life did Rienzi excite such scandal and censure as by the profane use of the porphyry vase in which Constantine, a foolish legend, had been healed of his leprosy by Pope Sylvester. With equal presumption the tribune watched or reposed within the consecrated precincts of the baptistery, and the failure of his state bed was interpreted as an omen of his approaching downfall. At the hour of worship he showed himself to the returning crowds in a majestic attitude, with a robe of purple, his sword and gilt spurs, but the holy rites were soon interrupted by his levity and insolence. Rising from his throne, and advancing towards the congregation, he proclaimed in a loud voice, "'We summon to our tribunal Pope Clement, and command him to reside in his diocese of Rome. We also summon the sacred college of cardinals.' We again summon the two pretenders, Charles of Bohemia and Louis of Bavaria, who style themselves emperors. We likewise summon all the electors of Germany to inform us on what pretense they have usurped the inalienable right of the Roman people, the ancient and lawful sovereigns of the empire. Unsheathing his maiden sword, he thrice brandished it to the three parts of the world, and thrice repeated the extravagant declaration— and this too is mine. The Pope's vicar, the Bishop of Orvieto, attempted to check this career of folly, but his feeble protest was silenced by martial music, and instead of withdrawing from the assembly he consented to dine with his brother tribune at a table which had hitherto been reserved for the supreme pontiff. A banquet such as the Caesars had given was prepared for the Romans. The apartments, porticos, and courts of the Lateran were spread with innumerable tables for either sex and every condition. A stream of wine flowed from the nostrils of Constantine's brazen horse. No complaint, except of the scarcity of water, could be heard, and the licentiousness of the multitude was curbed by discipline and fear. A subsequent day was appointed for the coronation of Rienzi, Seven crowns of different leaves or metals were successively placed on his head by the most eminent of the Roman clergy. They represented the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost, and he still professed to imitate the example of the ancient tribunes. These extraordinary spectacles might deceive or flatter the people, and their own vanity was gratified in the vanity of their leader. But in his private life he soon deviated from the strict rule of frugality and abstinence, and the plebeians, who were awed by the splendour of the nobles, were provoked by the luxury of their equal. 
His wife, his son, his uncle, a barber in name and profession, exposed the contrast of vulgar manners and princely expense, and without acquiring the majesty, Rienzi degenerated into the vices of a king. A simple citizen describes with pity, or perhaps with pleasure, the humiliation of the barons of Rome. Bareheaded, their hands crossed on their breast, they stood with downcast looks in the presence of the tribune, and they trembled, good God, how they trembled! As long as the yoke of Rienzi was that of justice and their country, their conscience forced them to esteem the man, whom pride and interest provoked them to hate. His extravagant conduct soon fortified their hatred by contempt, and they conceived the hope of subverting a power which was no longer so deeply rooted in the public confidence. The old animosity of the Colonna and Ursini was suspended for a moment by their common disgrace. They associated their wishes, and perhaps their designs. An assassin was seized and tortured. He accused the nobles, and as soon as Renzi deserved the fate, he adopted the suspicions and maxims of a tyrant. On the same day, under various pretenses, he invited to the capital his principal enemies, among whom were five members of the Ursini and three of the Colonna name. But instead of a council or a banquet, they found themselves prisoners under the sword of despotism or justice, and the consciousness of innocence or guilt might inspire them with equal apprehensions of danger. At the sound of the great bell the people assembled, they were arraigned for a conspiracy against the tribune's life, and though some might sympathise in their distress, not a hand nor a voice was raised to rescue the first of the nobility from their impending doom. Their apparent boldness was prompted by despair. They passed in separate chambers a sleepless and painful night, and the venerable hero Stephen Colonna, striking against the door of his prison, repeatedly urged his guards to deliver him by a speedy death from such ignominious servitude. In the morning they understood their sentence from the visit of a confessor and the tolling of the bell. The great hall of the capital had been decorated for the bloody scene with red and white hangings. The countenance of the tribune was dark and severe, the swords of the executioners were unsheathed, and the barons were interrupted in their dying speeches by the sound of trumpets. But in this decisive moment Rienzi was not less anxious or apprehensive than his captives. He dreaded the splendour of their names, their surviving kinsmen, the inconstancy of the people, the reproaches of the world, and, after rashly offering a mortal injury, he vainly presumed that, if he could forgive, he might himself be forgiven. His elaborate oration was that of a Christian and a suppliant, and as the humble minister of the commons he entreated his masters to pardon these noble criminals, for whose repentance and future service he pledged his faith and authority. "'If you are spared,' said the tribune, "'by the mercy of the Romans, will you not promise to support the good estate with your lives and fortunes?' Astonished by this marvellous clemency, the barons bowed their heads, and while they devoutly repeated the oath of allegiance, might whisper a secret and more sincere assurance of revenge. A priest, in the name of the people, pronounced their absolution. They received the communion with the tribune, assisted at the banquet, followed the procession, and after every spiritual and temporal sign of reconciliation, were dismissed in safety to their respective homes with the new honours and titles of generals, consuls, and patricians. During some weeks they were checked by the memory of their danger, rather than of their deliverance, till the most powerful of the Ursini, escaping with the Colonna from the city, erected at Marino the standard of rebellion. The fortifications of the castle were instantly restored, the vassals attended their lord, the outlaws armed against the magistrate, the flocks and herds, the harvests and vineyards, from Marino to the gates of Rome, were swept away or destroyed, and the people arraigned Rienzi as the author of the calamities which his government had taught them to forget. In the camp Rienzi appeared to less advantage than in the rostrum, and he neglected the progress of the rebel barons till their numbers were strong and their castles impregnable. 
From the pages of Livy he had not imbibed the art, or even the courage, of a general. An army of twenty thousand Romans returned without honour or effect from the attack of Marino, and his vengeance was amused by painting his enemies their heads downwards, and drowning two dogs, at least they should have been bears, as the representatives of the Ursini. The belief of his incapacity encouraged their operations, they were invited by their secret adherents, and the barons attempted with four thousand foot and sixteen hundred horse to enter Rome by force or surprise. The city was prepared for their reception. The alarm bell rung all night. The gates were strictly guarded or insolently open, and after some hesitation they sounded a retreat. The two first divisions had passed along the walls, but the prospect of a free entrance tempted the headstrong valour of the nobles in the rear, and after a successful skirmish they were overthrown and massacred without quarter by the crowds of the Roman people. Stephen Colonna the Younger, the noble spirit to whom Petrarch ascribed the restoration of Italy, was preceded or accompanied in death by his son John, a gallant youth, by his brother Peter, who might regret the ease and honours of the church, by a nephew of legitimate birth, and by two bastards of the Colonna race, and the number of seven, the seven crowns, as Rienzi styled them, of the Holy Ghost, was completed by the agony of the deplorable parent, and the veteran chief, who had survived the hope and fortune of his house. The vision and prophecies of St. Martin and Pope Boniface had been used by the tribune to animate his troops. He displayed, at least in the pursuit, the spirit of a hero, but he forgot the maxims of the ancient Romans who abhorred the triumphs of civil war. The conqueror ascended the capital, deposited his crown and sceptre on the altar, and boasted, with some truth, that he had cut off an ear which neither pope nor emperor had been able to amputate. His base and implacable revenge denied the honours of burial, and the bodies of the colonna, which he threatened to expose with those of the vilest malefactors, were secretly interred by the holy virgins of their name and family. The people sympathised in their grief, repented of their own fury, and detested the indecent joy of Rienzi, who visited the spot where these illustrious victims had fallen. It was on that fatal spot that he conferred on his son the honour of knighthood, and the ceremony was accomplished by a slight blow from each of the horsemen of the guard, and by a ridiculous and inhuman ablution from a pool of water which was yet polluted with patrician blood. A short delay would have saved the Colonna, the delay of a single month which elapsed between the triumph and the exile of Rienzi. In the pride of victory he forfeited what yet remained of his civil virtues, without acquiring the fame of military prowess. A free and vigorous opposition was formed in the city, and when the tribune proposed in the public council to impose a new tax, and to regulate the government of Perugia, thirty-nine members voted against his measures, repelled the injurious charge of treachery and corruption, and urged him to prove by their forcible exclusion that if the populace adhered to his cause, it was already disclaimed by the most respectable citizens. The Pope and the Sacred College had never been dazzled by his specious professions. They were justly offended by the insolence of his conduct. A cardinal legate was sent to Italy, and after some fruitless treaty and two personal interviews, he fulminated a bull of excommunication in which the tribune is degraded from his office and branded with the guilt of rebellion, sacrilege, and heresy. The surviving barons of Rome were now humbled to a sense of allegiance, their interest and revenge engaged them in the service of the church. But as the fate of the Colonna was before their eyes, they abandoned to a private adventurer the peril and glory of the revolution. John Pepin, Count of Minorbino, in the Kingdom of Naples, had been condemned for his crimes, or his riches, to perpetual imprisonment, and Petrarch, by soliciting his release, indirectly contributed to the ruin of his friend. At the head of one hundred and fifty soldiers, the Count of Minorbino introduced himself into Rome, barricaded the quarter of the Colonna, and found the enterprise as easy as it had seemed impossible. From the first alarm the bell of the capital incessantly tolled, but instead of repairing to the well-known sound, 
the people were silent and inactive, and the pusillanimous Rienzi, deploring their ingratitude with sighs and tears, abdicated the government and palace of the Republic. End of chapter 70, part 2《Part Three of the History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons. — The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Six by Edward Gibbon. Chapter Seventy: Final Settlement of the Ecclesiastical State, Part Three. Without drawing his sword, Count Pepin restored the aristocracy and the church. Three senators were chosen, and the legate, assuming the first rank, accepted his two colleagues from the rival families of Colonna and Orsini. The acts of the tribune were abolished, his head was proscribed, yet such was the terror of his name that the barons hesitated three days before they would trust themselves in the city, and Rienzi was left above a month in the castle of St. Angelo, from whence he peaceably withdrew, after labouring without effect, to revive the affection and courage of the Romans. The vision of freedom and empire had vanished. Their fallen spirit would have acquiesced in servitude, had it been smoothed by tranquillity and order, and it was scarcely observed that the new senators derived their authority from the apostolic see, that four cardinals were appointed to reform with dictatorial power the state of the republic. Rome was again agitated by the bloody feuds of the barons, who detested each other and despised the commons. Their hostile fortresses, both in town and country, again rose, and were again demolished. And the peaceful citizens, a flock of sheep, were devoured, says the Florentine historian, by these rapacious wolves. But when their pride and avarice had exhausted the patience of the Romans, a confraternity of the Virgin Mary protected or avenged the Republic. The bell of the Capitol was again tolled, the nobles in arms trembled in the presence of an unarmed multitude, and of the two senators, Colonna escaped from the window of the palace, and Ursini was stoned at the foot of the altar. The dangerous office of tribune was successively occupied by two plebeians, Cironi and Baroncelli. The mildness of Cironi was unequal to the times, and after a faint struggle he retired with a fair reputation and a decent fortune to the comforts of rural life. Devoid of eloquence or genius, Baroncelli was distinguished by a resolute spirit. He spoke the language of a patriot, and trod in the footsteps of tyrants. His suspicion was a sentence of death, and his own death was the reward of his cruelties. Amidst the public misfortunes the faults of Rienzi were forgotten, and the Romans sighed for the peace and prosperity of their good estate. After an exile of seven years, the first deliverer was again restored to his country. In the disguise of a monk or a pilgrim, he escaped from the castle of St. Angelo, implored the friendship of the King of Hungary at Naples, tempted the ambition of every bold adventurer, mingled at Rome with the pilgrims of the Jubilee, lay concealed among the hermits of the Apennine, and wandered through the cities of Italy, Germany, and Bohemia. His person was invisible, his name was yet formidable, and the anxiety of the court of Avignon supposes and even magnifies his personal merit. The emperor Charles the Fourth gave audience to a stranger who frankly revealed himself as the tribune of the Republic, and astonished an assembly of ambassadors and princes by the eloquence of a patriot and the visions of a prophet the downfall of tyranny, and the kingdom of the Holy Ghost. Whatever had been his hopes, Rienzi found himself a captive, but he supported a character of independence and dignity, and obeyed, as his own choice, the irresistible summons of the supreme pontiff. The zeal of Petrarch, which had been cooled by the unworthy conduct, was rekindled by the sufferings and the presence of his friend, and he boldly complains of the times in which the saviour of Rome was delivered by her emperor into the hands of her bishop. Rienzi was transported slowly, but in safe custody, from Prague to Avignon. His entrance into the city was that of a malefactor. 
In his prison he was chained by the leg, and four cardinals were named to inquire into the crimes of heresy and rebellion. But his trial and condemnation would have involved some questions which it was more prudent to leave under the veil of mystery, the temporal supremacy of the popes, the duty of residence, the civil and ecclesiastical privileges of the clergy and people of Rome. The reigning pontiff well deserved the appellation of Clement. The strange vicissitudes and magnanimous spirit of the captive excited his pity and esteem, and Petrarch believes that he respected in the hero the name and sacred character of a poet. Rienzi was indulged with an easy confinement and the use of books, and in assiduous study of Livy and the Bible he sought the cause and the consolation of his misfortunes. The succeeding pontificate of Innocent the Sixth opened a new prospect of his deliverance and restoration, and the court of Avignon was persuaded that the successful rebel could alone appease and reform the anarchy of the metropolis. After a solemn profession of fidelity, the Roman tribune was sent into Italy with the title of senator, but the death of Baroncelli appeared to supersede the use of his mission, and the legate, Cardinal Albornoz, a consummate statesman, allowed him, with reluctance and without aid, to undertake the perilous experiment. His first reception was equal to his wishes. The day of his entrance was a public festival, and his eloquence and authority revived the laws of the good estate. But this momentary sunshine was soon clouded by his own vices and those of the people. In the capital he might often regret the prison of Avignon, and after a second administration of four months, Rienzi was massacred in a tumult which had been fermented by the Roman barons. In the society of the Germans and Bohemians he is said to have contracted the habits of intemperance and cruelty. Adversity had chilled his enthusiasm without fortifying his reason or virtue, and that youthful hope, that lively assurance which is the pledge of success, was now succeeded by the cold impotence of distrust and despair. The tribune had reigned with absolute dominion by the choice and in the hearts of the Romans, the senator was the servile minister of a foreign court, and while he was suspected by the people, he was abandoned by the prince. The legate Albornoz, who seemed desirous of his ruin, inflexibly refused all supplies of men and money. A faithful subject could no longer presume to touch the revenues of the apostolical chamber, and the first idea of a tax was the signal of clamour and sedition. Even his justice was tainted with the guilt or reproach of selfish cruelty. The most virtuous citizen of Rome was sacrificed to his jealousy, and in the execution of a public robber, from whose purse he had been assisted, the magistrate too much forgot, or too much remembered, the obligations of the debtor. A civil war exhausted his treasures and the patience of the city. The Colonna maintained their hostile station at Palestrina, and his mercenaries soon despised a leader whose ignorance and fear were envious of all subordinate merit. In the death, as in the life of Rienzi, the hero and the coward were strangely mingled. When the capital was invested by a furious multitude, when he was basely deserted by his civil and military servants, the intrepid senator, waving the banner of liberty, presented himself on the balcony, addressed his eloquence to the various passions of the Romans, and laboured to persuade them that in the same cause himself and the Republic must either stand or fall. His oration was interrupted by a volley of imprecations and stones, and after an arrow had transpierced his hand, he sunk into abject despair and fled weeping to the inner chambers, from whence he was let down by a sheet before the windows of the prison. Destitute of aid or hope, he was besieged till the evening. The doors of the capital were destroyed with axes and fire, and while the senator attempted to escape in a plebeian habit, he was discovered and dragged to the platform of the palace, the fatal scene of his judgments and executions. A whole hour, without voice or motion, he stood amidst the multitude, half naked and half dead. Their rage was hushed into curiosity and wonder. The last feelings of reverence and compassion yet struggled in his favour, and they might have prevailed, 
if a bold assassin had not plunged a dagger in his breast. He fell senseless with the first stroke. The impotent revenge of his enemies inflicted a thousand wounds, and the senator's body was abandoned to the dogs, to the Jews, and to the flames. Posterity will compare the virtues and failings of this extraordinary man, but in a long period of anarchy and servitude, the name of Rienzi has often been celebrated as the deliverer of his country and the last of the Roman patriots. The first and most generous wish of Petrarch was the restoration of a free republic, but after the exile and death of his plebeian hero, he turned his eyes from the tribune to the king of the Romans. The capital was yet stained with the blood of Rienzi, when Charles the Fourth descended from the Alps to obtain the Italian and imperial crowns. In his passage through Milan, he received the visit and repaid the flattery of the poet laureate, accepted a medal of Augustus, and promised without a smile to imitate the founder of the Roman monarchy. A false application of the name and maxims of antiquity was the source of the hopes and disappointments of Petrarch, yet he could not overlook the difference of times and characters, the immeasurable distance between the first Caesars and a Bohemian prince, who by the favour of the clergy had been elected the titular head of the German aristocracy. Instead of restoring to Rome her glory and her provinces, he had bound himself by a secret treaty with the Pope to evacuate the city on the day of his coronation, and his shameful retreat was pursued by the reproaches of the patriot bard. After the loss of liberty and empire, his third and more humble wish was to reconcile the shepherd with his flock, to recall the Roman bishop to his ancient and peculiar diocese. In the fervour of youth, with the authority of age, Petrarch addressed his exhortations to five successive popes, and his eloquence was always inspired by the enthusiasm of sentiment and the freedom of language. The son of a citizen of Florence invariably preferred the country of his birth to that of his education, and Italy, in his eyes, was the queen and garden of the world. Amidst her domestic factions she was doubtless superior to France, both in art and science, in wealth and politeness. But the difference could scarcely support the epithet of barbarous, which he promiscuously bestows on the countries beyond the Alps. Avignon, the mystic Babylon, the sink of vice and corruption, was the object of hatred and contempt. But he forgets that her scandalous vices were not the growth of the soil, and that in every residence they would adhere to the power and luxury of the papal court. He confesses that the successor of St. Peter is the bishop of the universal church, yet it was not on the banks of the Rhone, but of the Tiber, that the apostle had fixed his everlasting throne and while every city in the Christian world was blessed with a bishop, the metropolis alone was desolate and forlorn. Since the removal of the Holy See, the sacred buildings of the Lateran and the Vatican, their altars and their saints, were left in a state of poverty and decay, and Rome was often painted under the image of a disconsolate matron, as if the wandering husband could be reclaimed by the homely portrait of the age and infirmities of his weeping spouse, but the cloud which hung over the seven hills would be dispelled by the presence of their lawful sovereign. Eternal fame, the prosperity of Rome, and the peace of Italy, would be the recompense of the Pope who should dare to embrace this generous resolution. Of the five whom Petrarch exhorted, the three first, John the twenty-second, Benedict the twelfth, and Clement the sixth, were importuned or amused by the boldness of the orator, but the memorable change which had been attempted by Urban V was finally accomplished by Gregory XI. The execution of their design was opposed by weighty and almost insuperable obstacles. A king of France, who has deserved the epithet of wise, was unwilling to release them from a local dependence. The cardinals, for the most part his subjects, were attached to the language, manners, and climate of Avignon, to their stately palaces, above all to the wines of Burgundy. In their eyes Italy was foreign or hostile, and they reluctantly embarked at Marseilles, as if they had been sold or banished into the land of the Saracens. 
Urban V resided three years in the Vatican with safety and honour. His sanctity was protected by a guard of two thousand horse, and the King of Cyprus, the Queen of Naples, and the Emperors of the East and West devoutly saluted their common father in the chair of St. Peter. But the joy of Petrarch and the Italians was soon turned into grief and indignation. Some reasons of public or private moment, his own impatience or the prayers of the cardinals, recalled Urban to France, and the approaching election was saved from the tyrannic patriotism of the Romans. The powers of heaven were interested in their cause. Bridget of Sweden, a saint and pilgrim, disapproved the return, and foretold the death of Urban V. The migration of Gregory the Eleventh was encouraged by St. Catherine of Siena, the spouse of Christ and ambassadress of the Florentines, and the popes themselves, the great masters of human credulity, appear to have listened to these visionary females. Yet those celestial admonitions were supported by some arguments of temporal policy. The residents of Avignon had been invaded by hostile violence. At the head of thirty thousand robbers, a hero had extorted ransom and absolution from the Vicar of Christ and the Sacred College, and the maxim of the French warriors to spare the people and plunder the church was a new heresy of the most dangerous import. While the Pope was driven from Avignon, he was strenuously invited to Rome. The Senate and people acknowledged him as their lawful sovereign, and laid at his feet the keys of the gates, the bridges, and the fortresses, of the quarter at least beyond the Tiber. But this loyal offer was accompanied by a declaration, that they could no longer suffer the scandal and calamity of his absence, and that his obstinacy would finally provoke them to revive and assert the primitive right of election. The abbot of Mount Cassin had been consulted whether he would accept the triple crown from the clergy and people. "'I am a citizen of Rome,' replied the venerable ecclesiastic, "'and my first law is the voice of my country.' If superstition will interpret an untimely death, if the merit of counsels be judged from the event, the heavens may seem to frown on a measure of such apparent season and propriety. Gregory the Eleventh did not survive above fourteen months his return to the Vatican, and his decease was followed by the great schism of the West, which distracted the Latin Church above forty years. The Sacred College was then composed of twenty-two cardinals, Six of these had remained at Avignon. Eleven Frenchmen, one Spaniard, and four Italians entered the conclave in their usual form. Their choice was not yet limited to the purple, and their unanimous votes acquiesced in the Archbishop of Bari, a subject of Naples, conspicuous for his zeal and learning, who ascended the throne of St. Peter under the name of Urban VI. The epistle of the Sacred College affirms his free and regular election, which had been inspired, as usual, by the Holy Ghost. He was adored, invested, and crowned with the customary rites. His temporal authority was obeyed at Rome and Avignon, and his ecclesiastical supremacy was acknowledged in the Latin world. During several weeks the cardinals attended their new master with the fairest professions of attachment and loyalty, till the summer heats permitted a decent escape from the city. But as soon as they were united at Anagni and Fundi, in a place of security, they cast aside the mask, accused their own falsehood and hypocrisy, excommunicated the apostate and antichrist of Rome, and proceeded to a new election of Robert of Geneva, Clement the Seventh, whom they announced to the nations as the true and rightful vicar of Christ. Their first choice, an involuntary and illegal act, was annulled by fear of death and the menaces of the Romans, and their complaint is justified by the strong evidence of probability and fact. The twelve French cardinals, above two-thirds of the votes, were masters of the election, and whatever might be their provincial jealousies, it cannot fairly be presumed that they would have sacrificed their right and interest to a foreign candidate, who would never restore them to their native country." In the various and often inconsistent narratives, the shades of popular violence are more darkly or faintly coloured, but the licentiousness of the seditious Romans was inflamed by a sense of their privileges, and the danger of a second emigration. 
the conclave was intimidated by the shouts, and encompassed by the arms, of thirty thousand rebels. The bells of the Capitol and St. Peter's rang an alarm. Death, or an Italian pope, was the universal cry. The same threat was repeated by the twelve bannerets or chiefs of the quarters, in the form of charitable advice. Some preparations were made for burning the obstinate cardinals, and had they chosen a transalpine subject, it is probable that they would never have departed alive from the Vatican. The same constraint imposed the necessity of dissembling in the eyes of Rome and of the world. The pride and cruelty of Urban presented a more inevitable danger, and they soon discovered the features of the tyrant, who could walk in his garden and recite his breviary, while he heard from an adjacent chamber six cardinals groaning on the rack. His inflexible zeal, which loudly censured their luxury and vice, would have attached them to the stations and duties of their parishes at Rome, and had he not fatally delayed a new promotion, the French cardinals would have been reduced to a helpless minority in the sacred college. For these reasons, and the hope of repassing the Alps, they rashly violated the peace and unity of the Church, and the merits of their double choice are yet agitated in the Catholic schools. The vanity, rather than the interest, of the nation determined the court and the clergy of France. The states of Savoy, Sicily, Cyprus, Aragon, Castile, Navarre, and Scotland were inclined by their example and authority to the obedience of Clement the Seventh, and after his decease of Benedict the Thirteenth. Rome and the principal states of Italy, Germany, Portugal, England, the Low Countries, and the kingdoms of the North adhered to the prior election of Urban the Sixth, who was succeeded by Boniface the Ninth, Innocent the Seventh, and Gregory the Twelfth. From the banks of the Tiber and the Rhone, the hostile pontiffs encountered each other with the pen and the sword, the civil and ecclesiastical order of society was disturbed, and the Romans had their full share of the mischiefs of which they may be arraigned as the primary authors. They had vainly flattered themselves with the hope of restoring the seat of the ecclesiastical monarchy, and of relieving their poverty with the tributes and offerings of the nations. But the separation of France and Spain diverted the stream of lucrative devotion, nor could the loss be compensated by the two jubilees which were crowded into the space of ten years. By the avocations of the schism, by foreign arms and popular tumults, Urban the Sixth and his three successors were often compelled to interrupt their residence in the Vatican. The Colonna and Orsini still exercised their deadly feuds. The bannerets of Rome asserted and abused the privileges of a republic. The vicars of Christ, who had levied a military force, chastised their rebellion with the gibbet, the sword, and the dagger. And, in a friendly conference, eleven deputies of the people were perfidiously murdered and cast into the street. Since the invasion of Robert the Norman, the Romans had pursued their domestic quarrels without the dangerous interposition of a stranger. But in the disorders of the schism, an aspiring neighbour, Ladislaus, king of Naples, alternately supported and betrayed the Pope and the people. By the former he was declared Gonfalonier, or General of the Church, while the latter submitted to his choice the nomination of their magistrates. Besieging Rome by land and water, he thrice entered the gates as a barbarian conqueror, profaned the altars, violated the virgins, pillaged the merchants, performed his devotions at St. Peter's, and left a garrison in the castle of St. Angelo. His arms were sometimes unfortunate, and to a delay of three days he was indebted for his life and crown. But Ladislaus triumphed in his turn, and it was only his premature death that could save the metropolis and the ecclesiastical state from the ambitious conqueror, who had assumed the title, or at least the powers, of King of Rome. I have not undertaken the ecclesiastical history of the schism, but Rome, the object of these last chapters, is deeply interested in the disputed succession of her sovereigns. The first councils for the peace and union of Christendom arose from the University of Paris, from the faculty of the Sorbonne, whose doctors were esteemed, at least in the Gallican Church, as the most consummate masters of theological science. Prudently waiving all invidious inquiry into the origin and merits of the dispute, they proposed, as a healing measure, 
that the two pretenders of Rome and Avignon should abdicate at the same time, after qualifying the cardinals of the adverse factions to join in a legitimate election, and that the nations should subtract their obedience, if either of the competitor preferred his own interest to that of the public. At each vacancy these physicians of the church deprecated the mischiefs of a hasty choice, but the policy of the conclave and the ambition of its members were deaf to reason and entreaties, and whatsoever promises were made, the Pope could never be bound by the oaths of the Cardinal. During fifteen years the pacific designs of the university were eluded by the arts of the rival pontiffs, the scruples or passions of their adherents, and the vicissitudes of French factions that ruled the insanity of Charles the Sixth. At length the vigorous resolution was embraced, and a solemn embassy of the titular patriarch of Alexandria, two archbishops, five bishops, five abbots, three knights, and twenty doctors, was sent to the courts of Avignon and Rome to require, in the name of the church and king, the abdication of the two pretenders of Peter de Luna, who styled himself Benedict the Thirteenth, and of Angelo Corario, who assumed the name of Gregory the Twelfth. For the ancient honour of Rome, and the success of their commission, the ambassadors solicited a conference with the magistrates of the city, whom they gratified by a positive declaration that the most Christian king did not entertain a wish of transporting the Holy See from the Vatican, which he considered as the genuine and proper seat of the successor of St. Peter. In the name of the Senate and the people, an eloquent Roman asserted their desire to cooperate in the union of the Church, deplored the temporal and spiritual calamities of the long schism, and requested the protection of France against the arms of the King of Naples. The answers of Benedict and Gregory were alike edifying and alike deceitful and in evading the demand of their abdication, the two rivals were animated by a common spirit. They agreed on the necessity of a previous interview, but the time, the place, and the manner could never be ascertained by mutual consent. If the one advances, says a servant of Gregory, the other retreats. The one appears an animal fearful of the land, the other a creature apprehensive of the water, and thus for a short remnant of life and power, will these aged priests endanger the peace and salvation of the Christian world? The Christian world was at length provoked by their obstinacy and fraud. They were deserted by their cardinals, who embraced each other as friends and colleagues, and their revolt was supported by a numerous assembly of prelates and ambassadors. With equal justice the Council of Pisa deposed the popes of Rome and Avignon. The conclave was unanimous in the choice of Alexander V., and his vacant seat was soon filled by a similar election of John the Twenty-Third, the most profligate of mankind. But instead of extinguishing the schism, the rashness of the French and Italians had given a third pretender to the chair of St. Peter. Such new claims of the synod and conclave were disputed. Three kings of Germany, Hungary, and Naples adhered to the cause of Gregory the Twelfth, and Benedict the Thirteenth, himself a Spaniard, was acknowledged by the devotion and patriotism of that powerful nation. The rash proceedings of Pisa were corrected by the Council of Constance. The Emperor Sigismund acted a conspicuous part as the advocate or protector of the Catholic Church, and the number and weight of civil and ecclesiastical members might seem to constitute the States-General of Europe. Of the three popes, John the Twenty-Third was the first victim. He fled and was brought back a prisoner. The most scandalous charges were suppressed. The vicar of Christ was only accused of piracy, murder, rape, sodomy, and incest, and after subscribing his own condemnation, he expiated in prison the imprudence of trusting his person to a free city beyond the Alps. Gregory the Twelfth, whose obedience was reduced to the narrow precincts of Rimini, descended with more honour from the throne, and his ambassador convened the session, in which he renounced the title and authority of lawful pope. To vanquish the obstinacy of Benedict the Thirteenth or his adherents, the emperor in person undertook a journey from Constance to Perpignan. The kings of Castile, Aragon, Navarre, and Scotland obtained an equal and honourable treaty. With the concurrence of the Spaniards, Benedict was deposed by the council. 
but the harmless old man was left in a solitary castle to excommunicate twice each day the rebel kingdoms which had deserted his cause. After thus eradicating the remains of the schism, the Synod of Constance proceeded with slow and cautious steps to elect the sovereign of Rome and the head of the church. On this momentous occasion the college of twenty-three cardinals was fortified with thirty deputies, six of whom were chosen in each of the five great nations of Christendom, the Italian, the German, the French, the Spanish, and the English. The interference of strangers was softened by their generous preference of an Italian and a Roman, and the hereditary as well as personal merit of Otto Colonna recommended him to the conclave. Rome accepted with joy and obedience the noblest of her sons, the ecclesiastical state was defended by his powerful family, and the elevation of Martin V is the era of the restoration and establishment of the popes in the Vatican. End of chapter 70, part 3